Good morning, everyone. I can see that the majority of people have arrived. There's still a few people checking in, but I think we will make a start. Um, so if we can begin with a little bit about who we are at Brook and today's session. So for those of you who don't know us yet, Brook is a national charity offering uh, support with people's sexual health, well-being and their mental health. Our mission is to help people live healthy, happy lives that are free from inequality and which are strengthened by fulfilling relationships. Last year at Brooke, we supported 1.3 million people through our unique offer, combining clinical services, relationships and sex education, outreach in community settings, well-being programmes and mental health hubs. Our lifelong approach to sexual health and well-being means that people can benefit from our holistic services at any stage in their life. So my name is Dougie Boyd and I'm Director of Education and Innovation here at Brook and I would like to welcome you all to our panel event which is about developing professional curiosity. I'm really glad you've been able to join us. This session is part of the 2024 National Safeguarding Adults Week um, and during this week we'll be collaborating with our partners to explore different safeguarding themes each day. The themes will encourage us all to consider how we can all work together to establish safer cultures within our workplaces and within our communities. Our safeguarding panel sessions are safe, non-judgmental spaces, and we welcome different voices and perspectives. We want you to feel comfortable and to be safe to express yourself. We ask that you're honest, open and respectful when communicating. And just a note to say that we're going to be recording this session so people who cannot attend can watch it later on. There'll be time at the end of the session for questions and answers, and please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and you can do this at any time throughout the event. So before we get into the main thrust of the session, I would just like to provide a content warning for us all to be mindful of. In this session, we will consider the experience of organisations and individuals who work with people in crisis, and it's likely that we may discuss some challenging themes throughout the event. Please just be mindful for what's going on with you as we cover these issues. We've put some support organisations into the chat if you do feel that you need some support in light of our discussion. And please remember that you're absolutely welcome to dip in and out of the session as and when you need to. So with all of that said, I would like to introduce uh, the panel now. Um, I would like to give them a couple of minutes each to tell us a little bit about who they are and the organisation that they work for. And I'm going to go round um, in the order that I can see people on the screen. So Chris, you are first. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Wilkins. I'm a qualified social worker and practice educator. I've been in the safeguarding space for over 20 years. Uh, currently, I am a practice development mentor working for Slough Children First, uh, which is a children's local authority uh, safeguarding provider, uh, safeguarding uh, pre-birth right and through the ages of 25, absolutely engaged in adult safeguarding day in, day out. Nice to be here. Thanks very much, Chris. Simone? Good morning everyone. Um, yes, as Dougie has said, I'm Simone. I'm designated safeguarding lead at Brook. Um, I won't go into too much detail as Dougie already has regarding Brook, um, but we are a national charity supporting people with their sexual health and well-being. And just to add to the 1.32 million people that we've helped through our frontline services, as Dougie said, um, I'd just like to add that 50% of our clinical clients access digital services, um, almost 40,000 people have been supported by our all age clinical services, over 121,000 young people supported through our education and wellbeing work and 3,500 mental health and wellbeing interventions have um, been delivered. Um, so just to add a little bit of context there with regards to our work, but wonderful um, to be here and to see so many people. Thanks, Simone. Joanne. Morning everybody, I'm Joanne Ferns, I'm a qualified social worker and I work for Blackburn with Darwin um, Engaged Team. So we are the Missing From Home and Child Exploitation Team. So we work with children and young people, but also young adults where there are concerns in respect of sexual exploitation, but also criminal exploitation as well. Um, I've worked on the team for be coming up nearly nine years in January. Um, it's an area of work that I'm really passionate about. And previous to that, I worked in um, children and family safeguarding and child protection. Protection. So thank you so much for having me today. Really looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Um, and a massive thanks to our panel members for showing up this morning and giving their time. Um, a little 
tiny bit of background about me and my uh, safeguarding experience and practice. So my background is in both the education and the charity sectors. And for the past four years now, I've been executive safeguarding lead at Brooks. So I've been providing strategic leadership, but also um, functional line management leadership to our designated lead teams. Um, so although I don't do much of the kind of day to day safeguarding practice, I do have that strategic experience and strategic oversight. OK, so I know that each of our organisations um, has got a rich and extensive experience and safeguarding narrative. Um, and I'm looking forward to exploring all of that individually in a moment. But first, I would like to begin by asking all panel members the same question. Um, and that question is, um, why is uh, professional curiosity important and how does it play out either in your organisation or in your day to day practice? Um, professional curiosity is vital. Um, I think in everything that we do, when we're thinking around supporting young people and adults who potentially are at risk, um or those with increased vulnerabilities so that we can be um, really dil diligent critical in our thinking and thorough in all of our actions certainly when um i think about professional curiosity i think about kind of um preventing situations where abuse or harm could be overlooked ensuring that interventions are timely and appropriate and being genuinely genuinely interested in the person in front of us kind of asking those questions and being genuinely interested in people's lives um, and some of the wider context in that certainly um, to add to making every contact count i think we need to adopt professional curiosity um, about adversity and trauma in our in our in our work so being kind of vitally important to take time to listen to the people that we're working with understand what lies behind potential behaviors that people may be presenting with so certainly when we're thinking around broken and um, people who are attending clinic people that we're kind of having contact with within education counseling and um, wider well-being services to understand what lies behind the behaviors that potentially they're presenting with and avoid jumping to any conclusions, making any assumptions around the behaviours that we may be seeing. So kind of working in that um, adversity and trauma informed way, being sensitive to the wider context of people's lives and how that might impact them and then how we might be best placed and what might be most appropriate um, in, in the ways and means of supporting them. Um, so certainly within Brook, you know, we work in that trauma informed practice, ensuring that we're creating safe, non judgmental spaces so that people feel safe to access our services to enable us to be able to have that professional curiosity and support them as best as we can. Uh, Joanne, you're kind of really different, aren't you, in terms of, you know, not providing a, a clinical NHS type services. So I'm wondering about what professional curiosity looks like for you and your organisation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's really tuning into what young people, children, parents, um, young adults are saying, but also what they're not saying as well. So like Simone was talking about, you know, picking up on those little sort of nuances around behaviours, things that we might be seeing, but also what are we not seeing? What are we not being told when people, you know, when we might be encountering um, young people and families, What what's not being said? And it's about tuning into that and being really curious about that. And it's, it's using our own expertise as practitioners as well to, to be able to, to, to ask permission and ask those questions and I think just asking questions and not just taking you know when we're when we're doing assessments or when we're you know we're very time restrained sometimes in what we do aren't we in, in terms of we've got this to do and we've got that to do and I think it's as being as a uh, being able as a practitioner to take that step back and actually give yourself time to reflect and if we do need a little bit more information about something it's about having the ability to say actually I'm going to ask you another question about that or I'm really interested in what you said there or I've noticed that you know we found that topic a little bit difficult to talk about can we can we talk about that a little bit more and it's professional curiosity I think in our world is it's just vital in what we do from that very first you know as, as Simone and Davin have said from that first contact that we have with somebody who might be in crisis or you know who we might be extremely worried about and there's a lot of risk there it's about um 
you, you know, from that initial contact, really tuning into what's being said and then filter, you know, allowing that to filter through in terms of every single contact and showing that genuine interest in, in young people and remembering why as practitioners we're intervening with children and, and young people as well because we've got such an important role and we might be the only professional that's having that conversation at that time with that person um, and it's really, really vital that we use our skills and our knowledge in that moment to be able to, to build that picture and to understand what it is that we're working with so that, that that can help to inform the next steps and what we do as practitioners and, and as professionals to support that that child or that young person and i don't want to preempt anything that you're going to say later on in this session joanne but there's something in there that is also about the bravery of the practitioner when you know when you are faced with x amount of minutes that you're allowed to see a client um it's not just about kind of utilizing your own innate curiosity it's also having the bravery to say no we're going to stop we're going to take more time we're going to unpick this um and i think that's something that sometimes we we underestimate um when we're encouraging people to to put themselves into those spaces chris so you're another side of the same coin aren't you coming from local authority social care background um so i'm wondering is it exactly the same are there any differences well thankfully it's quite reassuring that i would say there's a, there's a common thread that sort of runs through it all really and I, and I think that everyone sort of picked up on it really i think ultimately it's fundamental you know in our business we're about people for people and people working with people um and we should be about ultimately being curious and to increase opportunity for people. And um, sometimes it's about keeping them safe within that. Um, but I would say there's definitely similarity. And I think the similarity that I'm hearing about is about this genuine and, and uh, authentic interest in people and their well being. And knowing that, regardless of the situation that you're working in or the context that you're coming from, that, you know, people, it's a fundamental right that they should be happy, safe, loved, thriving, and we should be creating opportunities for them and sometimes stepping in to keep them safe for whatever that reason uh, might be. Um, but I would say for thinking about it in terms of that professional curiosity, it's understanding actually in, in having that sort of skill and that, I, I suppose, responsibility, it's knowing that we approach everything with a sense that our line of work is a privilege and it should be treated as such. And that should be driving the professional curiosity in that we ultimately do want the best by the people that we come into contact with, whether that be a one off isolated contact interaction or a long standing one. We're there for a reason. So we need to practice with heart. And I think really that is what professional curiosity is. We can learn it. We can develop it. But ultimately, we're humans and there's a connection as humans and we should be striving for better for each other. And I think, you know, regardless of the professional organisation we're coming from, even what our, 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 our background skills are, that's what we're talking about, I would say, when we're talking about professional curiosity. I think that's really interesting, the idea that working in this space is a bit of a privilege and I could see other people nodding. Um, definitely when I first kind of really came to safeguarding from a senior leadership perspective, it was all about the process. It was if you put in X amount of interventions, if you follow this chart on a bit of paper, this will result in good safeguarding. And it's been quite a shift to get people to realize that it's it's it, frameworks are you know very important, but it's so much more than that. And it's that right, that privilege to work with people in these very difficult, in these very challenging spaces that's something that organizationally it's quite difficult to achieve those sorts of culture shifts brilliant okay fascinating um really interesting to hear the things that are similar um but also the slightly different um inflections that each of us have on it because of of the organizations that we come from or the context that we safeguard in it feels like you experience the safeguarding landscape a little bit differently within your organization so i was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how professional curiosity helps you develop your practice with both your your clients and with your staff yeah, absolutely. So in terms of it, I talked a little bit about, you know, the assessment that we do. So um, previously, sort of exploitation services, um, 
you know our assessment was very tick box it was it was indicators it was you know if a, if a young person's experiencing x y and z then they must be being exploited and I think professional curiosity we saw a big shift a few years ago we actually um we rewrote our assessment to allow for professional curiosity to, to come in and um, because what we thought you know what we really recognize is actually that practitioner that's working with that child or that young person or young adult has such an understanding you know they might be seeing that young person two or three times a week um you know and it, yes you know indicators and toolkits have a place in terms of sometimes yes we have to be very directive and when we've got a safeguarding issue you know we need to be really clear about what we're seeing and, and you know and and that leading on to obviously the action that we take but actually there's so much room and there's so much scope for reflection and actually giving practitioners that ability to to hypothesize because i think um a lot of the time we think people come to us for solutions because they want a pro they want the problem to be solved and we can almost sometimes fall into that category of just assuming that you know that's what we need to do but actually you know we've we need to be wondering about what's going on it might be this or it might be that and I think um you know in our field with exploitation it's such a gray area there's no real black and white and professional curiosity really allows you as a practitioner you know and and the young people's workers that I that I'm that I help to manage it gives them that framework to be able to say actually there's a lot of uncertainty here what are we worried about we might be worried about this on one day but then the next day we might be really worried about that and it gives people that ability as as um practitioners to actually have those questions and talk about that and then what we see as managers is actually we can use that in supervisions because again it's really important within supervisions that you're trying out those hypotheses last time we talked about this I'm wondering if we're still concerned about that or if things moved on a little bit um, and it's that ability to ask questions and to write questions as well and I know as a practitioner myself when I started to learn a little bit more about um, professional curiosity and we started to see it a lot more coming into practice into social work practice through um systemic practice approach really um it was that ability to it's okay to pose questions and to write questions in your notes and and to think you know one week you might be really worried about this and then to look back and reflect a couple of weeks later actually we're less worried about that now but now we might be more worried about this and I think professional curiosity just gives you that framework as a practitioner when you're working with clients young people children's families to have those conversations with them but also in our reflective space and in our safe space such as supervisions it gives us that framework to have those discussions because I think it's just so important that like I said it's not just thinking about solutions and this is what we need to be doing it could be this that we need to do or it could be that that we need to do and that's really fluid and that will change from you know when we, from the initial assessment that we might do you know, it might change from week to week, but it might take a number of months for that to change as well. And it's always holding those hypotheses and always trying that out and testing that out and, and giving you that ability to really to really think through why we're we working with this person, what are we worried about? And as that changes, being able to track that as well. Is it difficult to get staff to engage in yeah, practice through hypotheses so you know people you're right people want us to have the answers and we're all in that moment where we get the phone call where we we get the pen portrait of the client and particularly with your clients where they will be people probably by the time they come to you they are at significant risk of harm so uh, as people we will be feeling like our stomach is dropping as we are you know taking the details of the case down in those moments is it difficult to get people to engage in hypotheses when all we want are clear answers because we think that's going to keep people safe yeah it can be and I think it, it needs that sort of system and organization change and I think that the wider organization at Blackburn with Darwin in terms of all children's social care there's been this big shift to hypothesizing and I think you know absolutely in times of immediate safeguarding we need to be directive sometimes and actually you know we need to take a certain action to take immediate safeguarding but we might come back to it the next day and have a reflective discussion or a hypothesis so, so it's that ability to think we did that at that time because we needed to take the action but actually you know we do things like learning circles and um, reflective discussions where we come together as a group of practitioners where it might be our team and the safeguarding team where we might have to take it we've taken action at a certain moment in time but it's actually going back to it because it's about influencing future practice as well and I think professional curiosity can really help to influence those those changes that you know sometimes we might not get it right we might make a decision and something wasn't right but again it makes you to, to it gives you that ability to reflect to, to inform your future decision making as well and that's why it's so important so something about uh 
uh, process and culture having to come together and work together. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. OK, Simone, um, Brooke and you and I have been on quite a journey over recent years, having moved from being an organisation who delivers services predominantly, almost wholly to young people from 2019 when we moved to delivering all age services for adults. So I'm just wondering, could you talk us through what professional curiosity means to us at Brooke and what we've learned about it as a result of the kind of the journey that we've been on? I absolutely, Doug. And I'm still kind of um, thinking around what Joanne was just talking around there. And sometimes the nervousness of um, just to kind of add the nervousness of sometimes things do change and we make decisions with a rationale that we have at that moment in time. And then that can change from a day to day kind of perspective and it's okay like I just picked up there from Joanne talking that that is okay that that practice is really helpful to kind of reflect and think and have a rationale for decisions that we may have made at that moment in time and that does move it's fluid we're working with people we are people you know and we're an organization ourselves so I just thought that was really kind of important just to kind of um, share that thought that I was having there and um, it really resonated with me um so yes, thank you. I wanted to share that. But moving back on to your question there, Doug, I think, yes, safeguarding adults. I think our learning at Brook is um, it's different, safeguarding adults as it is to children and young people. However, fundamentally, we still have that professional curiosity. So whether we're working within the legislation of children and young people um, and regulatory requirements or that that, that of um, adults, we still have that professional curiosity in ultimately taking an interest in the people who are accessing our services, in the people that we're coming into contact with um, daily um, through our work and thinking more widely around kind of that professional curiosity, having an awareness of kind of what adults may experience that may very well differ slightly to what children and young people experience, but still that kind of combination when we're thinking about professional curiosity, we're still looking, we're still listening, we're still asking those direct questions. We still want to kind of check in with people who are accessing our services and reflecting on information. They might be openly telling us kind of what we're observing, um, throughout that and having that kind of source of we're not in this alone so it isn't for Brooke within a sexual health um, organisation that we have to be the people that ultimately kind of safeguard all the way through that journey we might you know enlist the support of other professionals to so that multi-agency um, approach so seeking information triangulating some of the information if we hold a concern or, we, or we've kind of professional curiosity has been sparked, whether that be children, young people or adults, um, having conversations and triangulating some of that information with external professionals, maybe they be statutory services, maybe they be kind of wider um, services that, that may be involved um, or are currently supporting anyone. But a kind of really key to that is we've talked around where we're maybe identifying risk, identifying kind of concerns and vulnerabilities, but also working with professionals um, within that to identify strengths and protective factors. So what's working really well um, for, for someone kind of, um, you know, with what we've kind of learned or understood um, with them. So we can build on some of the protective factors and strengths, but kind of that multi-agency approach with that. And I think that's particularly important um, with adults. But one thing I think we've certainly kind of understood is there's grey areas, and Joanne said this, there, there are many, many grey areas, and one organisation alone isn't really best placed to be supporting people. So that multi-agency approach really does support us, certainly when we're supporting adults, um, and of course, you know, when we're supporting children and young people as well. Thank you. Okay. So far, so good. We are all speaking from a similar place. And given that we have kind of carefully curated the panel, it would be quite strange if one of our panelists were to come on and say, professional curiosity is not important. We're not having anything to do with it. Um, but it's it's good that we are all on brand, so to speak. Um, so with that in mind, Chris, I was wondering if you could talk us through then some of the risks some of the challenges to professional curiosity as 
you experience it and your organization experiences it we know it's a good thing but what what um yeah what's what what puts it in jeopardy lovely thank you um i think what i would always encourage people to do i suppose is ask yourself a question on a sort of personal individual level because we have responsibility as professionals to make sure we're sort of practicing as well as we can but we're in the organizations that we work as well so i suppose and people that are joining the webinar maybe sort of sit there and reflect to yourself are you in yourself and within your organization and your organization as an organization are they can cultivating conditions for professional curiosity to thrive and I suppose if the answer is no to any of those questions or subsections of those questions then that's a risk and um, so what we're talking about if we think about some of the themes that are coming out in these conversations we're sort of agreeing that professional curiosity when it's working well and we're doing our best with it and, and by it it's about understanding it's it's formed on relationships, those interpersonal relationships, understanding it's a senses thing, it's about what you're seeing, it's what you're uh, experiencing, what you're feeling, what you're smelling sometimes, you know, that sort of drives that curiosity. It's understanding that as an organisation, again, it, it, for curiosity to fry, there has to be certain things in place. So a commitment to a culture. So it's about the people, you know, selecting the right people within that culture and making sure that, you know, you're bringing people into um, your organisation that, there is a shared uh, value, a shared endeavour about what you're trying to achieve, you know, on behalf of the organisation, but then also uh, individuals then that access your organisation. It's the same with training, a good training offer. So actually you're able to practice day to day with a sense of confidence, um, knowing and just picking up on some of the things that both Joanne and um, Simone had said, it's the supervision is absolutely important. And maybe if you're not getting it, I suppose question why, because what we've identified um, one of the, I suppose, complications of professional curiosity is it's getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, working with grey, um, safe uncertainty. You know, we hold multiple hypotheses and actually that's right to do because we are working with people and it's not straightforward and it never should be. And at the same time, the risks are quite high for people and, and individuals. So you have to make sure all of these things in place, people, structures, organisations, training, the supervision that goes around it. But I think one thing that I would say, if you think about the risks, and I don't think we probably talk about it enough, it's us as individuals. I suppose it's we bring ourselves every day to our work and for us to be our best, we need to be our, at our best. And as a really important part of that is the self-care bit. It's about being kind to yourself, being compassionate to yourself, because you have to give a lot of yourself in this line of work to be authentically professionally curious and do it well. You you have to acknowledge there's days where you may not be at your best to do your best within that that lens. So if we think about it in that context, you know, um, I talk about it uh, and hopefully people can relate, you know, the first time every time, whether you're a health practitioner or a social worker, when you're qualified or just coming into the field, you go to that first interaction, whether it be a consultation, you know, as a health professional or a home visit as a social worker, there's a level of excitement almost because you're, you're at senses are really attuned and alert because it's the first time that you're doing it what the challenge is with professional curiosity uh, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of risk think about and ask yourself you know are you cultivating conditions for it to thrive there's something about trying to recreate that sense of the first time every time because it's when you're probably at your most alert and you're most attuned and you know the first time you go and do a home visit you probably prepped for hours thinking about all possible eventualities of course in time that becomes and less it becomes more innate and it becomes more part of your professional being but you still need to try and create that sense of the first time every time and I think that's the thing about the risks to it if you personally aren't taking responsibility of your own care and self-care and the organization aren't putting in some of those infrastructures and frameworks and also interested in your personal welfare then I suppose there could be risks around the effectiveness of professional curiosity so always come back and ask your that question are the conditions you know are they being cultivated for curiosity to thrive thank you we've had a really interesting question come into the question and answer box and for the audience please do put your questions into that box um that asks us to consider that very thing what what can be done when you're in an organization where that sort of stuff isn't happening so we'll come to that at the end of the session but um yeah, I think it's 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 really interesting that we've got somebody possibly with lived experience of um, those kind of 
processes and structures and frameworks not being in place, but still wanting to do really good safeguarding. Um, so yeah, we'll come to that later. If I could just ask the panel, in those kind of golden moments, um, sometimes it feels frightening when somebody's telling you something, um, th there's that that fear. And I wondered, is it that how is it that our task is how do we encourage staff not to feel frightened in that moment, or actually do we want them to feel the fear and still take the safeguarding actions? I'm not sure if if you know anyone in the panel has a has a thought on that. I'm happy to sort of share and sort of come in. I would say it comes back to sort of safeguarding. It's a shared responsibility. It's a shared endeavour, and even if you're in that moment with that young person adult on a one-to-one, -one, you're not on your own. You've got a whole safeguarding community uh, around you. They may not be physically in the room, but you should have the confidence that the minute you leave that room, that you've got access to resource, you've got access to expertise, you've got access to support. Um, and I would argue that anyone feels that they're on their own, there's possibly a challenge within your organisation because that should never be the case. It's absolutely um, a shared responsibility. And I think it goes back to the point of self-care. Like we would never... Um, expect um, a young person or, or an adult to sort of um, deal with or face the safeguarding concern, whatever it is on their own with, with no support. So why would we have that expectation on professionals in, in, in managing it? it? It just shouldn't shouldn't happen. So uh, I agree with the, the sentiment that, you know, these golden opportunities, we absolutely need to take them. And I think I talk about it in the realms of, you know, um, treating every interaction as a as an intervention, regardless of how big or how small it is. You could be a professional seeing, you, you know, the person you're trying to support over a long period of time. It may be a one-off isolated um, contact, for whatever better word, but every interaction is is an intervention. But absolutely, it's, it's serious safeguarding, but it shouldn't be scary because you are part of a secure, um, part of the community. Great, thank you. So listening to all of that, Joanne, um, you know, there, there, there's always that thing in safeguarding where a client or a vulnerable adult or a young person will disclose something. They tend not to disclose things by accident. People tend to disclose things to us because they want us to do something with it. But I think your field is really quite idiosyncratic because exploitation is one of the most hidden types of crime, isn't it? Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell me about how you and your team and your organisation uses professional curiosity to, to keep people safe. How, how does it work when it's a particularly yeah, hidden crime? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, um, and that's something that we always say, you, you know, we we deliver a, a, as part of a team as well. We deliver a lot of training um, across Blackburn with Darwin to professionals. Um, and one of the things we always say is exploitation is a hidden crime by nature of um, the grooming process, whether that's sexual exploitation or criminal exploitation, you know, perpetrators in the way that they um, offend and the way that they target children, young people, adults, um, it's a very secretive in him because they want to carry on because they'll be gaining from that exploitation either financially or sexually or criminally that that um, perpetrator is gaining from that so you know they want to keep it hidden so the difficulty that we have then is is when you're supporting the the victim the young person the the young adult whoever that is um it's it's all sort of it's intertwined with their understanding and and as um Simone was saying right at the beginning that trauma-informed and shame sensitive nature of, of as us as professionals when we're interacting with children young people People, young adults who've experienced that grooming process you know we, we always need to remember that they themselves won't be recognizing themselves as a victim they themselves won't be recognizing the harm that they've experienced the abuse that they're still being exposed to so it's so important that um i think as every single panel member said that every interaction that we have with that person is absolutely vital because you might be that one professional who they ring on that certain day or you see them on that certain day and what you're picking up on through your professionally curious stance whether that's what you're seeing what you're hearing what you're tuning into might be that really 
really vital piece of the jigsaw because you know we don't often get people coming to us saying help me I'm being exploited um you know sometimes it happens but often it's the people around them so it's either the professional network around them or the families the parents the carers um and that's why it's really important that we skill people up that maybe are working around a, a child or a young adult or somebody who's being exploited or we suspect that they're being exploited um to be able to be professionally curious in every sort of interaction that they're having to pick up on those little bits of um subtle changes because very often it is quite it will be very subtle um because that young person or that that young adult or adult won't um won't realize it themselves so how they're talking and how they're speaking um can often be at odds with what we're holding as the professionals as what we're hypothesizing about and what we're suspecting what we then might be seeing is very very different and the team that I work on so we're a multi-agency team so I'm from children's social care as I explained but we also have the police on our team we also have health um, and we have um, the Ivinson Trust are a specialist charity that work with parents and I think professional curiosity as well it's it's about that profession as I said it's about the professional network so what we see in our team it's about those conversations that we have with each other as well as the professional that might be supporting that that young person or that young adult um, we've got to be professionally curious with each other and have those challenging conversations because the police see things very differently to how we see things as safeguarding and um, practitioners and sometimes some of the conversations that we hear or when you're on meetings again as we've used the word brave but I think it's it's having that ability to have those conversations as well and at times when it is at odds with something that we're seeing or something that we feel having the ability to be able to challenge and be professionally curious with each other as professionals as well across the professional network it's it's not just us when we're interacting with the client or the 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 the, the young person or the, the the young adult yes we need to be professional curious there yes we need to be professional curious in supervisions but it's also I think we have a duty as a network of professionals to be professionally uh, professionally curious with each other um, and be able to have those brave conversations because you know as Chris was saying we're a network we're a community of safeguarding professionals we all want the best and we all want our clients young people adults whoever that is to be safe um, but we need to be to have those conversations with each other sometimes to challenge things because I think especially with exploitation everyone finds it quite tricky to manage so that's why we need a multi-agency team to be able to um, to like Simone was saying triangulate that information because we see facets of um, a crime sometimes or facets of what we think might be going on so again it's really important that we have those conversations with each other as well as professionals and 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 have that ability to ask questions and I think sometimes with with um, services such as the police um, you know as we've all talked about the culture and the organization and they themselves say well you know they don't have reflective supervisions and they don't have discussions so we find in our team because we are that multi-agency team and we all sit together we have that ability to ask questions and and to have those discussions and I think it's a, as practitioners feeling brave to be able to have that within meetings and, and professional forums as well um, and using professional curiosity within that within that environment too. As you were talking there um, Joanne I was wondering if you and your organisation and your clients experience a cliff edge when somebody moves from being a young person to being an adult in terms of how they are, um, how the risks to them are managed by different types of social care and by laws and legislation. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering what, what because somebody who is at risk of or being exploited when they are 17 years and, you know, 358 days or however old it is, that's not going to change when they move over to being 18. Do you do you experience that in your organisation? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, transitional safeguarding is something that's um, there's been a lot of positive change in the past few years with transitional safeguarding. So that's when um, children and young people move through their adolescence into adulthood. But it's a process and it's not just something that happens overnight. And just because they turn 17 point as you said to, to 18 one day um you will find naturally that statutory children's services um do you know come 
have to withdraw some of their services um, and other services do as well because their remit might be up until the age of 18 so we do find that um, for a lot of children and young people once they get to that age services do tend to step away but I would say within the past four or five years there's been a real positive change that services are adapting how they work so us ourselves we've um, we will work with children and young people at the when they turn 18 if they're open to us we will carry on that support um, the police have to view things quite differently because of I mean the age of consent is 16 so we see um, even the 16 plus that we work with if it's sexual exploitation and um, that can be a really tricky area but I think things like professional curiosity and our police always say to us they feel really lucky to work in an office with us because we make the children and young people seem really real to them they deal with things as, as you know as jobs and uh, it, it can be quite sort of clinical in that sense of how they how they work um, and that's how they they manage and that's what they do and obviously the law is very black and white but as we think we've said all the way through this there's such a gray area in safeguarding as well um and I think, you know, when when young people, children and young people get to that age of 18 and they do be turn, turn adults, they need just as much security around them and safety net around them. And I think luckily we are seeing a, a change in that in those services. However, I think there's still a long way to go um, with, um, you know, with services and, and, and service response to supporting those children, to supporting those adolescents really. And, you know, even just recognizing that adolescence is a process that happens till you're 25. Um, you know, we'll support care leavers up until the age of 25 um, as well. So I think it's, it's um, yeah, lots of changes have happened, but I, th I still think there's a long way to go. And I think as professionals, when you're supporting, if your service doesn't support post 18, it's really thinking, you know, at 17, what transitional safeguarding measures can I put in place for this young person? Who is going to still be there when we have to withdraw our support? Um, and preparing that young person for that transition is really important. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting point that you made, particularly about sharing an office with the police, because I think as people who who engage in safeguarding in the day to day, we are really, really good at bringing uh, the story, the narrative alive for other people. And we're often able to do that really quickly, really succinctly, because we've got to take action. Um, it, it's very much part of our skill set and part of our trade. But there's also something about how we support other organisations and other agencies to do the same thing and to almost hear the bringing alive of the story as we're telling it, as opposed to applying the legal or legislative framework. Um, and that that's a different skill set and a different challenge. Do you mind, can I just add a, a point to that as well? Because yes. I think it's a it's a good point that we need to think about. I, I think sometimes we think about challenge almost through a sort of a negative lens, really. We get a bit embarrassed around challenge sometimes, but actually we need to hold it very firmly with um, challenge as an act of care. You know, so we're only challenging because we care and we'll challenge our um, colleagues internally we'll challenge ourselves with our reflections but you know externally as well when we're working with the police health organizations you know we're only um, providing some challenge because we really want to get to the nuts and bolts of what might be going or at least trying to increase that understanding a little bit more so I think if we again invite everybody to reframe it slightly you know we're challenging because we we, we care that's the only motivation here yeah and could yeah. I just add to Chris's there just thinking of that the other side in receiving kind of challenge and some of the questions that we like that just resonated with us then they're learning, learning opportunities for us for our organizations um and it's really positive uh, i think to have those conversations and certainly receive challenge receive some of those critical questions some of that critical thinking because then we can kind of have that wider reflection on our practice on our culture within our organization and really take, take learning from that so every single kind of opportunity where where, where that happens for us to it, it can be really tricky when you receive any kind of what we would deem to be criticism or challenge but actually that's really healthy and that's really positive for us and every single one of those is an opportunity for us to kind of take some wider learning and wider ref reflection from that as well so it's like flipping that both sides and seeing the the real positive benefit of that yeah, I would really agree. I, I was just reflecting in my own mind there um, on when we launch a new service in a new area, it always takes a while for the kind of the, the 
the networks to be really working and and i've never thought about it in that way i absolutely know the services where we have a brilliant relationship with children's social care and it is so easy um so yeah that's a i think that's a that's a really important point um so we we've had a really really strong focus on the client on the person on the the, the people making the disclosure um simona i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what do organizations do so what what does somebody like brooke do to develop professional curiosity in teams in colleagues what for, from an organizational perspective what are some of the things that can be done um that's a really good question and i think it falls on really well from the conversations that we've been having um I think truly for safeguarding to be as effective as it can be, and certainly, you know, we've had a question come into the Q&A that you kind of um, said has, has come in. Uh, um, it's about the culture, so creating that culture. And one of the things that I certainly feel really proud um, within Brook and to be working for an organisation like Brook is we absolutely see safeguarding as a top priority. So wherever anyone is kind of based um, within the organisation geographically and kind of um, organisationally, um, safeguarding is a top priority and um, it is really important. But one of the things that we do to kind of create that, it isn't that um, any one person leads with safeguarding. So, you know, if we kind of take a service, for example, where we've talked a little bit around no one, I think Chris touched on this, it isn't for one person to make a decision. I think it's really having the confidence that nobody is ever on their own with safeguarding. So it isn't that people can't make those decisions on their own. But what we do have is we create that kind of, um, culture and the atmosphere that um, we do discuss cases, we kind of have the opportunity to discuss um, what we may have observed, what we may have come across, what we might need to do and kind of have some of that shared decision making, some of that shared reflection. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, I think certainly if we think a little bit about the practice and process that we have within Brook, of course, we have the policy and procedure that supports us um, with all of that. But it's also that practice and practical element as well and creating kind of those um, spaces where staff feel really confident um, to approach safeguarding and I'm sure we've all been in those situations where we have felt particularly uncomfortable with kind of what we're observing, what we're disclosing, but it's building and allowing the kind of space for people to to gain and build on that professional confidence, professional curiosity with the support of others, with kind of where we have policy and procedure in place, but more than that, kind of the practice based element. So. And the example kind of like a little bit of the structure is, of course, yes, we have the policy and the procedure um, that supports us to have all of these practical elements. But what we also have as well is kind of that wider safeguarding training. So anyone that kind of come in, comes into Brook, um, irrelevant kind of whether they're going to be front facing or whether they're kind of going to be a little bit more office based, everybody kind of has that base level mandatory safeguarding training before we kind of get through that, um, you know, initial two, three month period. And then we look to build on that. So we look to build on that with kind of additional levels of safeguarding training and also encourage maybe what's not not mandatory as well. So kind of what's local within the local areas where people are working when we're looking at a training perspective. But Joanne's kind of touched on this where we think about kind of that reflective practice. Absolutely, we have um, opportunities, um, some of those mandatory, some of those not mandatory, where we have safeguarding supervision sessions, reflective practice sessions, and really creating that culture that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility and that no one person's decision overrides another person's decision. It's about having those reflective practice, those discussions, taking the learning from that, that shared decision making. Um, and really enabling people to feel confident with their thinking, their reflections around it, as opposed to kind of a hierarchy. So it isn't kind of taking away that hierarchy. Of course, yes, we have escalation and support mechanism mechanisms, but everybody's reflections um, and thinking around the case is equally as important as anybody else's within our organisation and really creating the culture for that, um, I think certainly supports us 
in where we're thinking about how we develop our professional curiosity as kind of professionals within Brooke as an organisation. Great, thank you. Um, I, I do have a follow-up question, but I'm not going to ask it because I think it will be captured better by the question that we've had submitted by one of our audience members. So we will uh, we'll come to that. Um, so we've heard some really good examples of structural things that organisations can do um, to support safeguarding culture and practice. Um, Chris, I was just wondering if we could kind of tilt 360 now um would could you give us an example kind of bringing to life an example of where you've encountered or maybe you yourself have used professional curiosity to keep somebody safe yeah sure i'm just sort of thinking back over sort of 20 years plus of safeguarding i think all the situations where tangibly somebody's been kept safe because of an interaction or intervention it's always been with a level of professional curiosity it's never happened absent of it so i think it's just to sort of make make that point but i think one that sort of stands out to me it was one that happened early on in my career and i think looking back at it sort of reflecting on the, the conversation today, I think the reason it stood up is because the subtlety of it. Actually, I think curiosity does play out quite subtly sometimes. In a scenario I can think of, I was sort of fresh into social work and it was one of the first families I worked with. Um, it had come up from early help and there were some concerns that were escalating and increasing, but very much in the realms of a young couple with a three-year-old toddler. Um, and I suppose the framework around there was concerns about, you know, parenting skill and, you know, so low, low level neglect, really. And, and I think I was sort of given this particular family being sort of newer into sort of social work. So I could sort of, you know, I suppose practice social work. So it would be considered of our sort of lower end of safeguarding at that point, but still equally important. Um, but I can remember sort of providing this intervention and this goes back to the senses bit. You know, that's what I was asked to do. That's what I told the concern was. And I'm going in doing what was parenting work but would leave every time feeling quite uncomfortable. There was a, there was something in the room I just couldn't quite put my finger on. There was a, an interaction or a sense that just was, one felt uncomfortable, but there was hostility, but there was no evidence. There was nothing being verbalized. There was nothing being witnessed. It was a feeling, but we carried on providing the intervention. I think in that, you know, relationship sort of grew. And I remember in time taking it back to my supervisor saying, there's just something that I can't quite put my finger on. And I remember verbalizing it. There's a sense of uncomfortableness in the room, almost hostility. I don't know what it is. But I think at that time, my supervisor sort of led me to sort of be thinking around, well, that's maybe because you're a social worker going into the household. And although I heard it, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel that to what it was. But again, I still couldn't verbalise it. And there were no other hypotheses that were being thrown. And to be honest, I wasn't really that skilled to know to hold multiple hy hypotheses. But to cut a long story short, things continued after a while. And I had an opportunity with mum on her own. And without giving details away, she disclosed, you know, some quite long standing domestic violence in her relationship with her partner at the time. Um, so safeguarding occurred and you know um, she was kept safer as was the child moving forward work and intervention was actually put in place where actually they, they did reconcile not as a couple but you know to be able to pair them but I think the takeaway learning to me was that bit around the human element you know we are humans and sometimes we can't verbalize it but we have senses you know through the years we as humans have developed and you know fine-tuned our our in, in internal senses and it sort of taught me to sort of follow the feeling sometimes you can't put name to it but just follow the feeling but I think the other bit that sort of really stood out was the relationship element I, I think something happened although I couldn't name it at the time I felt that disclosure came because there was a sense of safety in mine and the mother's relationship I didn't think that I was doing anything remarkable but I think in the turning up being consistent and I was motivated by genuine understanding and care for this person I didn't know the that the care needed to be around the relationship and possible domestic violence I just knew there was care that's why I was involved so I think there was that bit about the relationship the develop the persistence but then there is that moment about sort of having opportunities to see people on their own in different situations in different circumstances so you can triangulate and test um, and you know see that relationship play out in other ways but for me it stands out it's the subtleness of all of that things clearly those things are applied in much more significant situations but what I would say is that happened over time where the relationship was developed but it doesn't mean you still can't work those principles in a one-off encounter you can still 
create trust, create a relationship and create a sense of safety in people. So by being curious and then whatever will follow, will follow, but follow the feeling as well. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, we um, have had loads of really interesting, thought provoking, challenging questions coming through the question and answer function. Um, thank you all so much for engaging in the way that you have. We're going to do our very best to get through as many um, as we can now. Um, and what I will do is I will just bring the question out and see if there are any panel members who think that they can speak um, well to it. Um, so the first question which really interests me is, can the panel speak um, about the pitfalls of confirmation bias within professional curiosity practice? Um, and I don't quite think we've we've picked up on that. So I, I was just wondering, do yeah, what how do we deal with confirmation bias? Um, is it just something that is necessarily part of it and we need to be mindful of it? Um, what's the panel's experience of it? I think for me, I think acknowledging that it can exist, <laughs> um, but we need to take really assertive efforts for it not to be uh, a thing or not as prevalent. I think um, we've spoken about hypothesis quite a lot, but again, hypothesis is sensible, you know, and it's really good to hold multiple hypotheses, like at least two as a minimum, really. And then it's sort of working through and working out actually out of all of that, what might it be? I think the pitfall of confirmation by bias is really that you're limiting opportunities, you're shutting down doors, you're shutting down lanes of explore, um, exploration. And I think, you know, more than one thing can be true at the same time. And I think it's about walking that through a little bit and working it out with your colleagues, with your peers, you know, to make sure you've got those mechanisms around you. So I suppose there's two bits, acknowledging that it exists, and I suppose putting in assertive efforts to challenge that really, as I say, because the decisions that we're making, you know, they're nuanced and complex. So we need to sort of walk that path, knowing that, um, and knowing there's not one thing that's going to sort of work through that with you. I think that's really interesting. I was, I was just thinking about my own confirmation bias, um, in probably it was like maybe about five to ten years ago where you know being somebody who grew up in the 80s and 90s um with the HIV epidemic there was always this thing that you use condoms every single time that you have sex um and I remember working with a 17 year old boy who was not using condoms and I was absolutely spinning out. I was like, oh my God, this is awful. We need to get you in, you know, you're going to die. It's going to be terrible. And there was a whole thing where there was, there what actually was a safeguarding concern that was not him having unprotected sex, but because my own confirmation bias was sparking out, that took up all the space that, that created so much white noise. Um, so yeah, I think it is that thing about, um, realizing that as much as we want people to be curious and to be wholehearted and to be um, brave in these spaces, we also bring our own prejudices and blind spots and neuroses along with us. And it's important to, to try and find a way to see through those in practice. And I think if you're a professional in those teams, again, assuming these spaces are, are safe, you know, maybe be if you feel that there's not enough curiosity, be that person, ask the what if questions, you know, there's no harm in it, you know, so if it is the thing that people believe it is, then you should be able to walk that journey and get there anyway, but you might as well put a couple of uh, alternatives on that path as well, just to test out, there's nothing wrong with testing out and challenge. So that perfectly leads me into the next question, because one of the spaces that we would try and unpick some of this sort of stuff is with colleagues or in supervision. Um, and one of our audience members has asked, how do we support the development of professional curiosity for practitioners such as DSLs in schools who don't always receive supervision? Um, and I think the DSL role in a school can be a really, really lonely one. Um, so, yeah, I was just wondering, do we do we have are there ways where uh, there can be some safeguarding colleagues who are quite isolated because of the organisation or the structures that they work in? Are there ways that they can develop their own professional curiosity? 
I think um, in that sort of circumstance, it's it's about maybe if if you've not got that within your own organisation, it's maybe using the network of professionals around you. So, for example, like, um, you know, and I can just speak from Blackburn with Darwin's perspective, but um all our all the schools in Blackburn with Darwin have a link in with our team so any um you know DSL from primary school secondary school can contact our engaged team and have that conversation and I think you know when it's about exploitation and we can have those questions and that that conversation and sort of engage in that professional curiosity so although we're not supervising in that sense but we could have those professional discussions. And like I said about with the police as well, because the police, they don't get the same reflective supervision and reflective, um, you know, abilities that, that sort of the safe spaces that we have. But I think it's about as, as um, you know, as we've talked about, like nobody's really in isolation. So even if your organisation is set up in a way where you don't have those mechanisms available to you, maybe you've got other professionals that maybe you can have those conversations with, um, you know, as we've said, even if it's a, a conversation with, your, the, your local safeguarding team, your MASH team, um, you should be able to have those discussions with that person, with that say, with that social worker and be able to have those reflective discussions. So although it's not classed as a supervision, it's maybe seeking out those opportunities where you can speak to other specialist services and say, I'm really worried about this young person. It might be sexual health. You know, speak to your local Brook team, speak to your local sexual health team or, you know, find out other services where you have got that um, niggle that you're just not quite certain about something you can ring up as a concerned professional and have that discussion um, and hopefully that will be an environment where you'd be able to have those you know have those reflective conversations but not kind of in the remit of supervision yeah thank you I think that's really helpful um I'm going to move to a, another audience question because I think it builds upon it quite well. Um, so this question is, are there any key aspects of professional curiosity when you're working in an organisation where there is not such an intense and ongoing relationship with users compared to the panel members? Um, I, I think that's quite interesting because we experience it within Brook that we will sometimes see um, service users for six hours once a week which enables us to build a, a great um, uh, understanding of, of them other times we may see them for 10 minutes in a single clinical intervention and a safeguarding action needs to come for that so like I, I'm wondering does the panel have any thoughts on those times where you can't build up a good relationship how we should approach professional curiosity in those instances let me take that back uh, you can build up a good relationship in any amount of time, sorry, but if you don't have an extended period of time to build up that relationship. Uh, and, uh, sorry, Chris, I know we've both jumped off mute there. Um, Chris, do you want to go first? No, you go first, because we probably think very similarly. <laughs> um, and I think we do have those interactions at Brook, and they're equally important um, as longer term um, relationships that we might build with people that um, are accessing our services and I think it comes down to the key kind of fundamentals again it's about being genuinely interested so we can be genuinely interested in someone in 10 minutes in 30 minutes in um, a period of time over a matter of weeks um, and creating those safe non-judgmental spaces for people so that trauma-informed approach so we can have sometimes we think of trauma-informed approaches as those longer term um, interventions a trauma-informed approach can be how we create our spaces when people walk into our clinical settings so what do we try to create when somebody walks through that door, when they walk up for the very first time um, to that person who sat behind reception, what spaces do we create there to enable those opportunities, whether they be shorter term, longer term, so that people feel safe, people feel comfortable. And in any of the interactions that we have, we are genuinely interested in that person so what are we seeing in that moment how is that person how are they kind of interacting with us in those shorter periods of time um and they are equally important we are starting to build those relationships within you know 10 seconds 30 seconds um in meeting any new people that we meet people with and it's about how we feel confident that those shorter term contacts with people we can create those spaces and they don't have to be long-term interventions and being genuinely interested in people um and 
I think Chris will say this kind of creating that every single um, interaction is potentially an intervention um, with someone. So whether that be short term, whether that be long term, every single interaction is as equally important and we can create that space and having the confidence that those spaces really matter as well it isn't always the long-term interventions and sometimes it could be i'm using an example here in clinic in, in our clinics somebody can walk through the doors and the person who sat behind reception can really do a brilliant job at creating that safe space so people feel really comfortable in that very first interaction with a Brook service. And they can also notice something that's quite concerning. They can notice how somebody's kind of interacting, who's walked into that clinic um, reception waiting room with them, how are they kind of interacting while they while they're sat in the waiting room. So kind of those two ways, more than one person in any interaction is observing all of kind of um, what goes on within that. So it's the kind of looking, feeling, listening, everything, um, thinking of all our senses in all of our interactions with people. Thank you. Chris, did you have something to chip in on that? Just to reinforce what Simone just said, I was thinking exactly the same. I think just to sort of conclude, I, I guess it's for anybody, regardless if it's a one-off interaction or you're working long-term with someone, just be present, be in the room, and be purposeful you're there for a reason and I think if you are working with people much short term you could be the person that um, um, the person that needs safeguarding has been looking for you've just been missing from their life I think hold that thought yeah okay that felt like it went so quickly um so audience members thank you so much for joining us today and for your many brilliant questions um, that you put into the, the Q&A section. I'm really sorry we didn't have time to answer them all. Um, panel members, thank you so much for showing up and sharing your expertise. Um, I am incredibly grateful and it's been really interesting to have the time to spend with you and, and hear about your experience and wisdom this morning. So thank you very much. Um, so with that said, that's us signing off now. So thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. And we hope to see you again at um, one of our future webinars um, here at Brook. Thank you.